Normally cameras shoot in the JPEG format, so if you have one of those cell phones that's able to take photographs like magic, when you make an exposure, even if it's with a cell phone, a little point and shoot camera, or the DSLR, a raw file is created, light pours onto the sensor, and if you think about it, your sensor is basically millions of tiny little solar panels. If you've got a 12 megapixel camera in your phone or you know one of the 24 megapixel cameras there, you've got either 12 or 24 million pixels. Tiny little solar panels. Imagine your sensor, it's this big rectangle, with 24 million solar panels on it. And when light hits a solar panel, what does it do? It turns it into electricity, and that's basically what's happening on your sensor. You click the shutter, light pours onto the solar panels, Every single little solar panel on there generates a different electrical charge, and that charge gets recorded and turns into numbers or digits, hence the term digital photography, and that becomes your image. Now, if you're shooting JPEG, here's the thing. The camera is going to take all that raw data and it's going to process it out into a JPEG file, and it'll record the JPEG to either your phone's internal memory or if you're shooting on the camera, it'll record it to the card, and then it'll throw away all of that raw data which had more information than the JPEG can contain. But if you're shooting in the RAW format, there's some things you can do with the RAW format that you can't do with regular JPEG images. White balance. You're basically telling the camera what color of light to expect. And white balance isn't a function of the RAW data. White balance is a function of how that data gets processed, how it gets turned into an image. So if you're shooting in the RAW format, you can change the white balance afterwards. I'll show you that in just a couple minutes. Another thing you can do, let's say you're photographing a wedding and you've got the, the grooms in a black tuxedo, the brides in a white wedding dress, and to make sure you don't lose any of the detail in the shadows of the, the tuxedo there, you open up the exposure, get it a little bit brighter, and you don't notice it, but the sunlight is reflecting off the bride's shoulder and blowing out some of the highlights in the shoulders up there. If you're shooting JPEG, would you be able to get the detail in those shoulder back, you know, all that beadwork, the lace, blown out to white? It's gone, isn't it? But with the raw format, you got a little bit of leeway for that exposure. So let's just take a look at the raw format. When you've got the files, go into the folder called Process These. We'll just go to the very top one there, IMG0086, and just double click it. And it should launch Photoshop, but it won't open the image just yet. This window will open up. All of the files in this folder, they're all either a little bit too bright or a little bit too dark or the white balance isn't quite right. And you'll notice that she has a bit of a, a cool tone, a bit of almost like a bluish sort of look. And if you're shooting JPEG, to correct this, you'd have to bring it into Photoshop. You'd have to go into your color channel. So you go to the blue channel, you'd play around with the amount of blue in it, and you could subtract some blue, basically warm it up a bit. But that's a destructive change. It's damaging to the file. With the raw file, and once you get it open, you'll see there's this slider up here called Temperature. If you pull it to the right, look at what happens to the image. You can warm up the, the balance of that image. So instead of being this sort of cool tone, which has a bit of an isolating, kind of you know, lonely sort of feel, if you warm it up a little bit, it gives it a different kind of feeling. So that's one of the cool things about the raw format. You can change the white balance after the fact. And the temperature relates to how blue or how yellow the light is. Uh, there's another slider below it that is green and magenta, and that relates to old school fluorescent lights. Old school fluorescence had a bit of a green cast, so you could take care of that by pulling this to the right and adding a bit of magenta to it. Another thing you can play around with is the exposure. And take a look at the histogram while you play with those sliders there. Notice at the very top right, you've got this little mountain rangey type thing here. When we pull the exposure, we can make the image overall brighter. And look at how that histogram slides to the right. You guys know what histograms are for? It gives you a rough idea of the distribution of tones in the image. So right now, here's your black point over here, here's your white point up here, and everything is pushed up towards the bright side. Here's white, everything is really bright. Some of the information has actually gone right past the end point here, and that's what this red here is. Uh, if you turn on your exposure warning, just click on that little uh, poop emoji there, you'll see that anything that's filled out to white will glow red. And if you pull the exposure the other way, and you turn on the... Uh, Exposure warning on the shadow side, anything that would fill into black will glow blue. So if this was being sent to a magazine for printing, this area right here would just come out pure black. There'd be no shadow information in there. Or anything that's in the red would simply print as white. So whatever color the paper was, that's what color we'd have in here. So the exposure just the overall, well, exposure of the image. But maybe you want to play around with specific parts of the image. Maybe in that wedding dress, uh, you're starting to lose the highlights and the beadwork and the lace. You don't want to pull down all of the information. You don't want to make the entire image darker. 
you can break it down into the highlights, the shadows, so we can take that highlight information and look at how the histogram moves this time. If I work the exposure and I darken it, everything slides to the left. That entire exposure gets darker, closer to black. But if I work the highlights, only the very right side of the histogram moves around. Or maybe I was starting to lose some shadow detail in that tuxedo and I wanted to lighten up the shadows in there. If I go to the shadow slider, pull this to the right, you can see that the darker parts of the image lighten up. And really, it's only the left side of the histogram that moves in that case. So I could darken down the shadows, lighten up the highlights, give it a little bit more contrast. I could darken the highlights, lighten up the shadows, kind of flatten the image out a little bit. So we've got a lot of control over the final look of that image. Another thing we can play around with is contrast. The difference between the shadows and the highlights, the darks and the lights. So we've got some dark areas down here. We have some light areas up here. And if we look at the histogram, they're all kind of in the middle around here. Typically, a histogram will start ideally down at nothing, kind of make its way up in kind of a mountain rangey sort of shape, and then kind of go back down to nothing on the other side. So here's all our midtones. There's nothing that's really dark. There's nothing that's really light. But if I wanted to give this a little bit more snap, a little bit more contrast, we've got a slider right here for contrast. Pull that to the right and look at that histogram. As you increase the contrast, the shadows will get darker. The highlights will get lighter, and you can see that histogram kind of splitting in the middle, expanding out to the right, expanding out to the left. If you pull the contrast down, if we lower the contrast, you can see everything pulling in towards the center, and you get a flat sort of grayish looking image. And really, middle gray in between black and white is kind of a washed out sort of look. So if this histogram is just a spike down the middle, that would basically be a 50% gray image, just a wash of gray. So the closer those details get towards the center, the grayer and the less contrasted the image gets. If you scroll down a little bit towards the bottom, you've got a clarity, vibrance, and saturation. These, I wouldn't really play around with too much. Like the saturation, the intensity or how close to the pure that color is. So if we crank that saturation way up, her eyes used to be a little bit blue, now they're really blue. Her lips used to be a little bit red, now they're really red. It kind of pushes everything to the maximum intensity of whatever color it is. Um, if we pull the saturation all the way down, what sort of an image do you think we would get? black and white. And watch the histogram. As I pull that saturation down, they start to align more and more closely. When we hit zero, they completely overlap each other. No channel has any dominance over the other, so there's no color casts up here. As we increase that saturation, you can see those histograms pulling apart. Another cool thing about the histograms, watch this. The image overall has a you know, relatively neutral kind of skin tone sort of appearance. If we warm up the image, look what happens to that histogram. The red and the green move to the right, and where red and green overlap, we get yellow. So it has this reddish-yellowish sort of cast. And sure enough, you can see that reddish-yellowish cast in the image. If we pull the temperature way down and give it a very cool sort of tone, you can see that it's now dominant in blue and deficient in red and yellow. And sure enough, there it is in the image. So the histogram gives you an idea of what sort of image you're dealing with, whether it's a warm tone, a cool tone, high contrast, low contrast, bright or dark. All right, so that's pretty cool. We can play around with the temperature. We can play around with the exposure. There's one other thing we can do with the raw format that you can't do with JPEGs. And that, it's a little bit geeky, but it has to do with bits. Anybody know what bits are when we're talking about computers? A bit is short for binary digit. So you take the two words, binary digit, squish them together, you get bit. And it's the smallest piece of information a computer can deal with. How do we usually represent bits? Anybody know? If you had to write them down, what would you put? You've heard of the binary language? Bi meaning two, because for each bit, there's two possible states, on or off, as the computers deal with them. Or as we write them down, ones and zeros. You ever seen that code where it's like one zero zero one one zero one zero one one? That's the only thing computers can deal with, is bits of information. And let's say we had a photograph where every pixel in the image could be represented by only one bit of information. I'm going to kind of simulate that with this image here. I'm just going to open this up. And I'm going to make an image where each pixel is either pure black or pure white. There's no shades of gray that are available. This image, every pixel could be represented by a single bit of information. If you had to make a decision where there's either a yes or no possibility, it's a binary decision, there's only two possibilities, you could flip a coin. And it would be either heads or tails. Uh, if you have a light switch, it can be either on or off. In computers, we would say that's either one or zero. In an image, we could say that's either black or white. And how many people remember uh, the first Macintosh back in 1984? None of you? Probably just me then. Uh, but the screens on those machines were one-bit displays. Every pixel on the screen was either black or white. Not only were there no colors on those computers, there were no shades of gray. Um, OK, so one bit is obviously not a very good way of representing images. One bit here, this one is on. One bit here, this one is off. We got black and white. But if we added a second bit of information to each pixel, how many possible shades of gray could be represented? 
What do you think? If we had one bit of information, it's either one or zero, white or black. With two bits, how many possible shades of gray could we represent? We could have one one, white, one zero, maybe a light gray. We could have zero one, that would be a dark gray, and we could have zero zero, which would be black. So we could have four possible shades of gray. So it would be a better image, but it still wouldn't be great. If you're shooting in JPEG, you have what's called eight bits per channel of capture. And if we look at the little pop-up here, look at that, there's your eight bits. Per channel, what are channels in photographs? Anybody know? Well, we've got three of them, red, green, and blue. And if I open this image up, you'll notice that each of those color channels, here's the red channel, here's the green channel, and here's the blue channel, each of these color channels is just a black and white photograph. And when you're working in JPEG, you're limited to eight bits per color channel, which means that for the red channel here, from the darkest black to the brightest white, there's only so many shades of gray. Let's see if we can figure out how many shades of gray from the darkest black to the brightest white there would be in an 8-bit per channel image. We decided with one bit of information, it's either on or off, white or black. With two bits, it's either on, on, white, off, on, dark gray, on, off, light gray, or off, off, black. So four possible shades. If we added a third bit of information, how many possible shades of gray could that color channel have with three bits? One bit of information had two possible states. We doubled it to four. Three bits, we double it again. It's actually doubling the possibilities. So two possibilities, four possibilities, eight possibilities. If we had four bits of information, how many possible shades of gray do you think there could be? We went two, four, eight. Well, how many people have their own laptops? And how much RAM do you have in them? Oftentimes nowadays, they come with eight gigs of RAM, maybe 16 gigs of RAM. If we add a fifth bit of information, how many possible shades of gray do you think there could be? We take 16, what's 16 times two? 32. And you might remember when cell phones had 32 gigs of storage in them. Um, if we added another bit of information, we double 32 to 64, okay. Are these numbers starting to sound familiar? 8 gigs of RAM, 16 gigs of RAM, maybe 32 gigs of storage in your phone. Maybe you got the 64 gig iPhone. These numbers pop up in computers all the time because of the binary nature of the way they count. We count in base 10, so for us we get things like 10, 100, 1,000, a million, a billion. Computers get 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. If we had seven bits of information, how many possible shades of gray from the darkest black to the brightest white could there be? 64 times two? 128 gigs in your phone. Or if you go up to eight bits of information, you could have 256 possible shades of gray from the darkest black to the brightest white. Now, if you've got 256 shades of gray in each color channel, you've got what's called continuous tone. So if you were to print a gray ramp from black to white with 256 shades, if you looked at any two shades side by side, they look pretty much the same. You get nice smooth transitions. Um, if you were to print a sunset where you get that nice orange in the center there, going to that nice beautiful blue in the sky, it would be a nice smooth gradient transition from the orange to the dark blue out there. But if you had less than 256 shades, like if you had only 10, you'd notice very distinct transitions of tone. So instead of seeing that sunset as you know, a nice smooth gradient, you'd see these distinct bands of color. And if you're working in JPEG, you're limited to that 256 shades of gray per color channel, which is fine, it's enough. But what happens if you want to make changes to that image? You want to make it a little bit lighter. You want to make it a little bit darker. Uh, you want to play around with the contrast. Maybe do some dodging and burning, which is darkening and lightening different parts of the image. Imagine you got an elastic string, and on this string you have 256 glass beads. A black bead down here at zero, and a white bead up here at 255. And all the different shades of gray in between. Any two beads side by side, pretty much can't tell them apart. They look to be the same shade of gray. But then you decide you want to brighten up that image. So you grab that middle bead and you start pulling it to the left. You pull it to the right to lighten or darken the image. What's going to happen to some of the beads on this side of the string if you pull the middle bead uh, over here? Well, if they're glass beads, they're going to pop off the string. You're going to lose some shades of gray. Um, and the beads on this side of the string, you pull it out this way, what's going to happen? You're gonna get little gaps in between them. You're basically doing some damage to the file. You now have less than 256 shades of gray. And if you do enough damage, you can end up with what's called banding. Let's see if we can find an example of banding in an image. Aha, look at this. This is a nice gradient from the, you know, the orange of the sunset all the way up to the top. But if I do a bunch of color changes to it, uh-oh, look at what we see going on in here. This is called banding, or you might have heard the term sometimes called posterizing. And basically, that's where there's not enough shades of gray. If we look at each of the individual channels, you can see that banding in the red channel, in the green channel, in the blue channel. Those transitions from one shade to another become quite obvious. 
Now, if you're shooting in the raw format, you have access to the usual 8 bits per channel, but you also have, look at this, 16 bits per channel. If you process an image out to 16 bits per channel, mathematically I think it's more, but in practice it works out to about 35,000 shades of gray. So you can imagine if you have that elastic string and you've got 35,000 glass beads on there, you grab the middle bead, pull it to the left, pull it to the right, you might lose a few hundred beads here and there, but it's not as big of a deal because you still have thousands of shades of gray left. So with raw format, you have this 16 bits per channel option, which gives you a much hardier, more robust, more resistant to damage file. So often you'll find that professional photographers are shooting in the raw format, they're processing up to 16 bits, and they're using as much as possible non-destructive ways of working on the images in Photoshop, but even if there is a little bit of damage done here and there, they've got that 16 bits of information to work with.